Thank you for joining us. And I appreciate the opportunity to talk to you again. Um, I am very mindful of the fact that the last time we talked about three years ago in this very studio, you sat here and you told me and our audience that Ukraine was facing a problem. Excuse That's me. That's true. And you said Ukraine was facing a problem. And you said what was going on in the Black Sea and the Azov Sea was a serious threat to Ukraine unless something was done to deal with it. And we're sitting here today, three years later, and exactly what you predicted is coming true. So what are your thoughts about what's happening? Well, we see that uh, Russia has decided to carry out its dream to erase Ukraine from the map of the world and to ensure that Ukrainian nation and Ukrainian state do not exist. And that's uh, exactly what it is trying to do at this particular moment. Uh, definitely the level of support we are having right now, Ukraine as a nation, Ukrainians as a nation and Ukraine as a state has never had in its history. So that gives us um, some hope that this existential war that we are fighting right now to defend ourselves and to defend uh, what we believe in, to defend our way, uh, our possibility to choose the way we want to, to build the country um, is going to be preserved. So with your help, I, I hope with the help of the, of the democratic world uh, and with our resolve, with our courage, with our unity to, to defend the country, uh, we will be trying to do our utmost in order to, to preserve the country. But we have to understand that Ukraine is not the end goal of Russian Federation. And we have to very attentively listen to what uh, Russian uh, authorities are saying, because back in 2021, at the end of the year, when the ultimatum of uh, Putin was set um, towards the free world, it was clearly stated that Ukraine comes first, and then he wants to ensure that he he comes back to the um, to the borders and to the uh, to to the uh, divide of 1997. So that's basically. Uh, goes against NATO, goes against uh, the European Union, goes against the space of democracy and prosperity that has been built after not only the Second World War, but after the Cold War has ended. The Ukrainian military has done an amazing job. Um, very few people gave them a chance against Russia when this war started, except those people that knew that the folks that have been fighting for Ukraine didn't start fighting on February 24th. They've been fighting since um, eight years ago uh, and before that. And they've developed a significant amount of expertise in how to defend Ukraine. And have, to your knowledge, you gotten the kinds of weapons that you need to make sure that Ukraine continues this brave and valiant fight against Russia? You know, it's important that we receive that uh, type of weaponry that uh, won't only allow us to continue fighting, but will allow us to win this war. And um, there we are not there yet, but definitely we are getting uh, already much more of something that we need. And that's very helpful because uh, you cannot go against, um, against uh, airplanes, uh, uh, prohibited bombs, uh, those shellings, um, artillery, tanks in huge numbers and ground forces in huge numbers barehandedly. So therefore, uh, for us, it's very, very important uh, what the US is doing, what the UK is doing, what other countries are helping us with, uh, also from the Central European states, from the Eastern European states. Uh, but again, we have to understand that um, there has to be a, uh, we have to make a leapfrog, so to say, from using the old type of the Soviet type of weaponry to NATO modernized and NATO standard weaponry and heavy weaponry. And, and I, I definitely didn't like the discussion that was ongoing. Finally, I think it's, we are already over it yet, whether Ukraine should be given 
um, offensive weapons besides the defensive ones, because in our case, every single piece of weaponry is defensive because we are defending our own country on our own land, on our own territory. So therefore, in order to ensure that where they um, digged in, in some areas, we have to use the uh, weaponry of uh, mid to long range in order to be able to get them uh, to get them out. And uh, some of it is coming already, but definitely there is more that could be done, starting from the fighter jets, uh, starting from uh, mid to long, uh, long range um, uh, air defense, uh, additional artillery, uh, munitions for, for all those weapons, um, special tanks already, armored vehicles, multiple rocket launch systems, and so on. So um, you're getting these weapons, more need to be sent, and as you said, the right kind so that you can win this war need to be sent. The U.S. and I think others in the West are now talking about something that seems to be pretty obvious. Russia has weakened itself. I mean, more than 21,000 Russian troops have been killed. I think something like seven or eight, nine top generals. There have been thousands of tanks and armored vehicle carriers and hundreds of planes and helicopters that have been destroyed in this war. So Russia's weakened itself uh, in part. Um, so the question that I'd like to ask you is, when you say when, what do you mean? Do you mean ending this conflict or do you mean getting all of your territory back? What does when mean? Thank you for asking this because this is very important. First and foremost, definitely it's restoring our territorial integrity, sovereignty and independence over the internationally recognized borders. That would be a win. But also having the right after that to choose our own path. And that means European and Euro-Atlantic integration as a choice of the Ukrainian people, because there is no way we Ukrainians can accept neutrality as Russia would like us to, to um, as Russia is demi demanding from us. We have to understand that back in 2014, when, uh, when Russia started its attack, we, under our Ukrainian legislation, were a non-bloc, non-aligned non country. But that did not preclude Russia from attacking and from grabbing part of our land in Crimea and starting the war in the east of Ukraine. So therefore, that means also uh, bringing everybody who is responsible for this war, and this is not only Putin, but all those who are carrying out uh, those orders who are giving additional orders, who are torturing our people, who are killing our people, who are raping our kids and, and women, and all those who are supporting this war, uh, bringing them to justice. And that, that has to be uh, done in some special tribunal where a, a something of the type of maybe Nuremberg uh, tribunal after the Second World War. Also, I believe that a victory for us and the win for us would be that Russia paid in uh, restitution um, all the um, uh, all the, the destruction for all the destruction that it has um, already brought to our land and all the moral moral and physical pain to all those families who have lost their lo loved ones loved ones or or got someone wounded in their families or who had to flee their their homes as their homes were destroyed. So I think that that would be a nice package to start with. And um, I think that at this particular moment, there is not enough understanding in the world that we have to ensure that Russia is defeated in this war. And um, there has to be some thinking made already um, now, what kind of Russia are we going to deal with after this war is over. And that brings me to the point that before the dissolution of the Soviet Union, um, Bush, uh, President Bush at that moment, two weeks before Ukraine announced uh, independence, has come to Ukraine and has delivered his so-called uh, uh, chicken key of speech, where he was uh, trying to persuade us not to even dare to think about uh, independence, but we had our own choice. And so right now, I think um, there is more kind of foresight thinking has to be done uh, in different analytical think tanks, in different um, institutions that would be prepared for a different Russia after its defeat 
uh, after it's not only weakened, not only takes another pause and starts yet another attack on Ukraine, but that it never ever gets to the point that it will be capable of um, of waging such type of a war as it was done basically with the uh, with Germany after the Second World War. I think that that's exactly what we have to ensure uh, what Russia goes through. Um, asking for forgiveness, understanding the crime, being uh, held responsible for the crimes of uh, war crimes, crimes against humanity and acts of genocide that it is carrying out on our land. And speaking of those acts of genocide, um, we've been hearing for several days now about these mass graves in Mariupol. Uh, and of course, we've seen images from Bucha and Irpin and other places around the country uh, in, in, in Ukraine where there have been just horrible things that have taken place. But um, there, there, there is word today, this is the uh, 26th of April, that there is another mass grave that's been discovered in Mariupol. Um, can you tell us about that scenario and what the people there have been forced to do? The, it's, the details that I've gotten are sketchy, but uh, can you tell us what you've learned about that situation? We have to understand that Russia right now in Mariupol is trying to cover up all the war crimes that have been and crimes against humanity and acts of genocide that have been carried out there. Because what they are doing, they are uh, exhumating the corpse of those people who have been killed there, who have gone also through tortures, who have gone also through uh, rapings and have been killed afterwards. And they are trying to put them right now in mobile crematoriums and, um, and ensure that the world will never learn uh, what type of death those people, besides the shelling, besides the pounding that um, this, that was um, carried out against that city, uh, that what they went through. Moreover, Russia is uh, also conducting other types of acts of genocide. It's forcefully is deporting our people, it's abducting our children and bringing it to, forcefully to the territory of the Russian Federation, giving them away to Russian families and not and sending Ukrainians to far eastern territories of Russia with no right, taking away their documents and with no right of return for, and movement for two years. Moreover, in the occupied territories, Russia is forcing right now Ukrainians who are on, the, on those territories to um, not to enroll, they are mobilizing them in the armed forces of the Russian Federation and are trying to send them to the war against um, you know, they are compatriots. That's another type of, of, uh, of the crime that Russia is carrying out. So all of this together with all this mass graves and, you know, um, this brings us to those um, um, atrocities that Russia is um, uh, carrying out against Ukrainians. And if we are talking about mass graves in Mariupol, only in Bucha, the mass grave of 14 meters long uh, in that mass grave, we found, uh, we, we recovered um, 70 bodies. And in Mariupol, the first mass grave was about 300 meters long. And this new one is not less than that. So that means that we're talking about thousands of people who have died there under, the, um, under this brutal and most barbaric attack when the flourishing and developing city of Mariupol with its dreams and with its people with its dreams has been um, just put down to, uh, to, to the ground. Oh. Let me ask you about this. Um, the third mass grave that you just mentioned that's been found in Mariupol, uh, some sources have been telling me that survivors have been forced to dig those graves uh, or and they've been forced to do it in exchange for food and water. Is that the same thing that you've been hearing? I've heard those stories and I think that once um, you know those people who have managed to escape from from Mariupol will have uh, well maybe to an extent will go over the psychological trauma that uh, they are under at this particular moment after they, they have managed to, to escape 
we will hear more and more of those uh, most horrible um, personal stories from people because uh, because we we you know we've heard this this cases when the when the mother was was there uh, was raped for a couple of days in front of the eyes of of uh, her son six year old uh, son and mother has died out of um, of those wounds and the sons here just turned gray so you can only imagine that obviously that little boy cannot tell you a little. A lot at this particular moment um, about what he has gone through or the other people that have suffered um, just terrible inhumane things there in um, in Mariupol and I'm totally not um, uh, dismissing the possibility that uh, people have in order to to get some water and some basic food uh, some piece of bread uh, they would have to 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 um, dig the, the mass graves and uh, and they were probably they, they were turning already you know they, they were trying to make those people not feeling as human beings anymore and that's what is uh, absolutely terrible that is definitely uh, reminding of the um, of the tragedies we've seen in the concentration camps of the second world war so just a couple of more minutes here. Um, I want to ask you one more thing. Some people have asked this question have not said a lot, but I think you're one of the people that I need to ask this question of, you know, you've been vice prime minister before you've served in the upper echelons of the government. Uh, and you, you've, 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 you've worked down at the, at the grassroots level too, to work up to that point. So, you know, inside out, Ukraine. What is it that you believe your message to Vladimir Putin is at this point? If you were to give him one, what would it be? I don't think that Vladimir Putin actually gets any message that could come from any Ukrainian. That is the person that has to be put behind the bars and has to um, bear the consequences of every single crime that he has committed. And I just wish that he feels all the pain, that his, his heart, if he does have one, I don't think that so, but he feels all the pain that every single Ukrainian family is going through in this particular a moment and I hope that his heart just is, is going to blow up from that uh, from that. Well, um, thank you so much, um, Madam Klimpush Tinsadze. Uh, you have been very benevolent with your time and um, we thank you for your candor. We thank you for your eloquence in speaking to us. Is there anything you want to add today that I haven't asked you about that you think is important? Well, thank you very much for for having this interview, conducting this interview, and definitely something to the to the American listeners. Uh, we greatly, greatly appreciate your support, and I definitely know that uh, the society in democratic countries right now is driving politicians with the so much needed help for Ukrainians. So just continue doing this, and then we all will celebrate our common victory and we'll be happy that we have defended something that we all believe in, in democracy, in rights, in the basic rights of uh, people to live. Well, thank you very much. We appreciate your time. Thank you.